Okay, we are delighted to see <laughs> John Gerwin as our speaker. Uh, John has been watching birds for a long time. <laughs> he has uh, been watching birds since about age five. And uh, as a, a teenager, he was uh, in the nature club. And um, that went on to uh, where uh, John got a BS in biology at the University of Minnesota and an MS in zoology from Louisiana State University. <laughs> Top to bottom. Um, I, there he studied uh, genetics of uh, tropical hummingbird species. Uh, he has been at the NC Museum of Natural Sciences for 24 years, and he conducts research on a variety of birds that breed in North Carolina. He serves on the NC Audubon uh, Important Bird Areas Technical Advisory Committee. Uh, he serves as on the review committee for the Piedmont region of NC Birding Trail Program. Um, He's been on the board of the Wake County Audubon Society since 2005 and is currently treasurer. He co-advises students at NC State University and the University of uh, North Carolina Wilmington. Uh, he enjoys a variety of public programs, uh, speaks at a variety of public programs across uh, North Carolina. He particularly enjoys uh, the city of Raleigh's Walnut Creek Wetland Center. Uh, he speaks Spanish and co-leads eco-tours to various Latin American countries, especially Nicaragua where he has two students studying uh, several species of migratory birds. Um, he works in his uh, uh, organizing committee for his neighborhood gardening for Wildlife Club, which is called the Wild West, uh, <laughs> uh, over in the Avon Perry uh, uh, district. And in his uh, spare moments, in his uh, fiance, uh, Kathy, enjoy uh, their rescue uh, puppy, uh, which is a um, I'm still not going to get this. Bouvier. Set. Bouvier. Um, called me. Bouvier de Flanders. Bouvier de Flanders. And I'm going to let him talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> John, we, we welcome you. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me out. It's uh, great to be back for another bird health competition. I've been, it's maybe the fifth one, I guess, I've been part of, so we always enjoy. Uh, it was about a year ago when, right after the last one, when I volunteered to give this talk, and it always seemed so far away and an easy thing to do. I didn't plan on us having a new building to open up downtown. And just about 10 days is pretty chaotic. But I got it done, so here I am to talk about something related, which is the uh, some cavity nesting birds. And yeah, very good. And the lights. So birds. Uh, you know, f uh, animals in general face a lot of challenges, birds are one of them, and in, in terms of cavity nesting birds, they deal with things like the removal of dead trees and snags, obviously that's a problem. Introduced pests that kill the vegetation that birds rely on. There's introduced pests that eat the birds. That's a problem if you're a bird. Um, <laughs> climate changes. Uh, you know, if those happen, it's going to especially affect habitats in the mountains. In the coastal region. So these are some pretty dire things that that birds have to deal with now and in the future. So I'm going to be talking about some of the challenges that uh, relate to birds that I've worked with or have colleagues that work with them. And then some of the solutions that people have come up with. And it's it's always a, a surprise to 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 look at what animals have done, in my case, look at what birds have done, what they've adapted to, and then like in the case of urban birds, and then, and then turn around and something happens, and you go, wow, I never thought that that would be a problem. They just adapted to something. So I do like to throw a little humor in it, and that's explained by this particular slide, which, um, <laughs> <laughs> if you're, if you imagine you're a bird that's just adapted to perching on wires most of your life, and now this comes along. So those, that's, it's something that's going to come up again as we, as we go through this. So one of the challenges for birds is predators. So you just see that this will come up a couple of times. Is this is what some birds have to deal with. And also, in an artificial setting, it's what we have to deal with when we're managing. Um, one of the predators is that, that the real up in the mountains, and in some places in Piedmont, it's a southern flying squirrel. It's actually a real bird eater of eggs and nesting. Um, snakes, everybody knows, are avian predators, but especially black rat snake is a really good bird eater. So what I wanted to do was tell you some stories about things that I've been involved with, 
as I tell the stories, um, hopefully uh, you'll be more interested than some of these people are in my talk. <laughs> <laughs> And to talk about uh, some of the solutions. I'm going to, I, when I first was putting this together, I do travel to the tropics, and I thought I'm going to pull out all these cool tropical bird stories, things you never heard of. But as I was pulling my slides together and the stories, I thought, you know, there's a lot right here, and I've been involved in a number of them. So I just came full circle and decided to do stuff right here at home. So I'm going to do the usual sort of mountains to sea trip, and then if there's time at the end, I'll circle back to a local one. I left it at the end, we may or may not get to it. Um, so I'll highlight also plants where I can because this is after all arboretum. And so I, birds obviously depend on plants and I've had to focus on that too for part of my research. So I'll try to tie that in where I can. And then, you know, just a few of the personal experiences that I've had while working with uh, folks and birds on these different projects. First, I just want to start out with what's a cavity because people have a different idea of what a cavity is and so do the birds. <coughs> And basically, it says, says right here, any hollow place or a hollow. I like that. That's simple enough. Just point out that there are animals that are primary excavators. So we think of woodpeckers. They're the ones that are making the cavities. But not all these birds are doing that. So we have what we call secondary users. They may go in and, and open up something that's really soft, sort of a, a, a re-excavation or, or cleaning things up. But you know, a lot of people think of cavity is a bird box, but there's more to it. And these are some of the things that I think of when I think of a cavity. <coughs> Dead wood is an obvious one. Here's a picture of that snag. Bird boxes, the second most obvious. But other ones, buildings. There are a lot of cavities in buildings that birds take advantage of. Caves are used by some birds. I'll talk about that. Vehicles are actually pretty common to be used by birds. So <laughs> there's one in particular I won't talk about, it, but it's funny how often you find them in tractor trailers that have been parked just a little too long. <laughs> Crevices and rocks and buildings and burrows. I mentioned some burrow nesting birds. This is one of those birds that I really won't talk about, but it's kind of cool. It's one of those wild stories of a bird in South America that nests in caves, but it uses echolocation. A person having to catch this outside the cave with two of its young. It's a cave nester. It uses echolocation to move around in the cave. It's a fruit-eating bird. It's out it, and it's nocturnal. So it flies around at night looking for stuff, uh, <clears throat> looking for the fruit that it eats. But again, that's what I, I was really thinking, oh, there's all these great things in South America, but again, there's great things here. So that's where I'm, that's where I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do. And I'm gonna start first in the mountains of North Carolina. This is a map, it's a little cluttered, but I really just want you to look at the gray. Because the gray is habitat, or it's an area above 2,900 feet. That's because I'm going to talk about some high, what we call high elevation birds. And when we talk about high elevation in North Carolina, it's generally above 3,000 feet. So we're talking about birds or their habitats at high elevation. It's three, and our highest peaks are, you know, 6,600 feet, but mostly between 3,000 and 5,500 feet, we have a fair amount of habitat. But just notice that it's also pretty fragmented across western North Carolina. So one of the first ones that I want to talk about is one of the smallest owls in North America and, and really in the world. You can see by its solid hand, it's not much more than six inches. It's called a northern saw white owl. That name comes from its sound. It does a sort of a double noted call that sounds like uh, the sound a saw might make as you're going back and forth. <laughs> and it is, and it's one of the, it's one of the smallest in the world. So this is a widely distributed owl across North America. The purple is the breeding range. And then in the winter, it's all over the place, even down into Mexico. <clears throat> One of the things that's interesting, besides being a um, cavity nesting bird, which you'll soon see, is this little purple spot right here in western North Carolina. So it's coming back to what we call the southern Appalachians. <clears throat> so this is an isolated population in the southern Appalachians. We're interested in those types of populations because they often turn out to be genetically distinct, so from a conservation perspective, we want to keep an eye on them. In the fall and winter in North Carolina, we do get a lot of migrants from up north. They come, they come here to Piedmont, the coastal plain. It's a hard one to find. It's a nocturnal bird. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to be just showing you some information about the breed. 
So it's a, as I say, it's a, it's a higher elevation. And here's a little guy, and he's obviously in a conifer. So it's normally way up high, and it likes to be in the uh, spruce fir zone. So when it breeds, it breeds above 4,000 feet in North Carolina. Now it prefers spruce fir, but it also really likes where spruce fir comes together and meets what we call northern hardwoods. So that's kind of a, gen a general habitat type, but it is a type, mostly northern red oak, yellow, black birch, you get sugar and red maple, and, it, and these, these are, this habitat occurs on the northern slopes of mountains, so it won't be in the southwest ridge, which is very dry and usually hotter, and won't even be on the southeast, it's the northeast and northwest slope. <coughs> So these guys are often not fully into the spruce fir, where, where they have been found, but where the spruce fir meets the northern part. So here he is, one guy hanging out in his cavity. They, uh, so they use natural cavities. Here's one that uh, was used. But they rarely seem to use artificial cavities. The natural, even though they're in conifer, spruce fir, they're, the cavities that have been found are in hardwood only. So it's, uh, some American beech is up there also. So it'd be a birch. Uh, birch is pretty soft inside, so often a birch tree. It might be a cavity in a dead spruce, uh, but mostly it's in these hardwoods. <clears throat> so those, uh, the cavity that it needs, it's, it's, since it's just big enough, would be a woodpecker of like a pileated or a flicker that excavates the cavity and then the out comes in. They will use nest boxes, but as we'll see, not very much. And I just want to point out that in North Carolina, there are several other owl species that also use cavities. So we have barred owls, which are pretty common around the state. We have barn owl, they're less common. They have the heart-shaped face. They just, they sound like monkeys. Well, actually barred owls do. Barn owl is screams, they scream. They hmm. sound like, you know, just <clears throat> spanking somebody, you know, punishing them. <laughs> And then screech out, they don't screech at all. They make a tooting sound like a bouncing ball or a whinnying sound like a horse. But they all use cavities and they will all use boxes. So a challenge, so I put some of the red things, the challenges rather, in red. For a bird up high like this, for the owl, we're worried about the potential climate change and insect pests. So Willie Adele did really hammer the Fraser fur. Storm damages have hit Fraser, fir, spruce, and parts of the northern hardwood, and then insect pests. Uh, well, I mentioned the insect pests. If the climate changes more and there's warming, then the northern hardwoods and the spruce fir are going to keep going higher and higher or disappear. We don't know a lot about this bird in North Carolina, so we don't know where they all are. We've done some surveys. We think there's only about 500 birds, but we're not sure. And if there is a habitat change, we certainly want to try to provide some connectivity to the north, because we think that's where the habitat's going to retreat. Uh, we certainly are interested in seeing more work done on invasive species, because that, that keeps coming up over and over. There's the ash or there's, there's the longhorn beetle hitting maple, there's the anthrax thing. So that's a problem. And just on breeding biology, they said we don't really know much about this bird in North Carolina. Only a couple nests have so a couple of colleagues of mine are putting up nest boxes as one of their solutions to try and along the Blue Ridge Parkway, they have permission to go up. Oops. Um, Mark and Marilyn are going out and trying these boxes. They've been doing this now for, I don't know, five years. They've put up 20 or 30 boxes. They haven't had any success yet. There have been a couple boxes found with owls in them. They were boxes put up for northern flying squirrel, which is an endangered species that folks manage for. And and, and some owls use those, so they're hoping they can attract some owls and get some data and figure out what's going on. But we really don't know much about it yet. Still kind of a, a mystery bird. Another bird near and dear to my heart. Um, it's, it's kind of a mythical name, the yellow-bellied sapsucker. People make fun of that all the time, and it's actually a real bird. And I was, I, I was lucky enough to be part of a, a study, co-chaired a multi-year, multi-agency study of the bird in the mountains. This is the male, females have a white throat. This is the common bird up north. So uh, people ask, why do we care about it in the south? And I'll show you in just a minute. You're probably pretty familiar with it from the sap wells you see on trees around here. Can you see that? 
Well, they don't. They do feed primarily on sap. There's an old story that they were having sap run to attract insects to eat the insects. They will eat an insect that walks by, incidentally. But they actually are there for the sap. They don't suck the sap, actually, they lick the sap. Their tongues are modified to look like a bottle brush, so it increases a lot of their surface area. <coughs> and that allows them to get a lot more sap per lick. But that's what they're at. Hmm. I've watched them do what they do, and both in the drilling out of these things and then just spending time at them. They spend up to an hour just drilling like a, a row of, say, a dozen holes. They have a very special way that they do it. Their bill is fashioned in a way, in a certain kind of chisel, and they have to get it just right and just deep enough to get the sap to flow the way they want. When they come back, so they migrate out of the mountains, and then we don't know where they go, and then other birds migrate down north into the Piedmont coastal plain, but not into the high elevation. So when these birds come back to the higher elevation, they'll start with hickories first when they're feeding. Hickory sap flows earlier in the season, and they know that, they figure that out. Then they shift over to red and sugar maples, and they will also use black birch. If you read the story in Nana No, uh, what was it, a month ago or so, you know, about cavity birds and the little thing to get some news out about the birdhouse competition, they mentioned a story of mine with black birch. And I'll, but I'll mention it here anyway, in case you didn't read it. And that is, I, I was curious if the birds really, could you taste anything or what there any taste to this stuff? And there was a bird feeding for about, again, about an hour working on these wells on a black birch. He was only about head high. So after about an hour, I couldn't take it anymore because he wasn't leaving. So I walked over <laughs> and he just, they're not very uh, shy. So he flew off just 20 feet and looked at me and I, uh, again, it was head high. The sun was hitting, it was glistening and uh, warm now. And uh, I just went over and just took a big old lick off the side of the tree. <laughs> <laughs> it really was tasty. And, and you know, we make uh, maple syrup and we make a, Soda, black of that birch beer soda. It's, it's actually it was really good. I, could, I don't know if they can taste it, but if they can, they got something cool. <laughs> this is why we're interested in the bird, even though it's, it's really common up north, all the way into Canada. Is that here again is another isolate, like the saw wet owl. The breeding birds are mostly in North Carolina, a few in southwest Virginia, one pair in northern Georgia and half a dozen or so in eastern Tennessee. That's why we're interested in figuring out what these birds are doing. And, and again, th these guys, uh, like I said before, they're above, uh, these high elevation things are above 3,000 feet. The, the woodpeckers don't seem to go much above 5,000. They are in the northern hardwoods, and that's pretty much it. Our, uh, part of our study was to figure out what they do to make a living. No, we, we had no data. Just a few observations, anecdotal observations after 50 years of bird watching, but nobody had really studied them. So we did that for two years, a lot, hundreds of hours, and we found that they began excavating in mid-April. Males do 90% of the excavation. It's kind of cold up there at 4,000 feet in mid-April, and it, it was really impressive to see them at it. They go for trees that have something called heart rot. That's where one of these fungi, it's a shell fungus, gets on the tree, and in this case, I noticed it a lot on black locusts. And there is a shell fungus that is specific to locusts. And where we were finding the nest, we were finding this fungus nearby. <clears throat> and although we didn't do actual measurements, this, was, this happens with another woodpecker I'll talk about in a minute, and some other birds, is that it causes this heart rot. And, <clears throat> and, it, and so it creates a condition not too unlike myself, where you have a very hard exterior and a soft, mushy interior. <laughs> Isn't that right, dear? <laughs> so they can get through that exterior, and if they find a soft inside, then they can quickly finish the job and get on with nesting. But what happens is we found that they did a lot of starts and stops and restarts. And it, one bird that I watched one time going around on a snag, tapping and turning his head as if he was listening to the resonance going around tapping and listening. And mm. if I could age these birds, and you can up to about the fourth year, if I could catch enough, mark them and follow them. I'm pretty sure this was an older bird who had learned not to waste his time working for two or three days, only to find he couldn't keep going and he had to go start again. Learn by the resonance. I'm pretty sure that's what was going on. Yeah. So it can take them one to two weeks to build a cavity that goes 
in, down, and then they hollow it out a little bit. Hmm. So by May, they're ready to uh, get going with their eggs. So it's a rare bird in the southern Alps. How rare? Well, we don't quite know. We found about 150 when we did a lot of surveys, but there's a lot of places we didn't go. And I'll just I'll show a map here in a minute that uh, relates to that. But first, I just wanted you to see what one of their cavities looks like. This is in a birch. They actually mostly did black locust and the two maple species, but this was an easy one to photograph. It was also really cool to see how the lichens grow. And then in the next picture, I'll show you the bird and how it blends in. But they stay in the they um, incubate for a couple weeks in May. The young spend almost a month in that cavity. And that, one of the things that was interesting that uh, my colleague Curtis and I, he's with uh, North Carolina Audubon, he was working on my grant at the time. Is that the timing of, of their nesting, and I keep doing that, appears linked to the service berry. So if you know Amalankir, up there there's one that flowers in late April. And it fruits in mid-June. Right about mid-June, these birds are about two to three weeks old. Hmm. And there's three or four of them in that cavity. And they're always hungry, so they're begging. And they make this really obnoxious beep, 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 beep. And when there's three or four of them, it's beep, 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 beep. And you can hear it 50 meters away in the woods. And I'm sure the adults are just, because they just always look like they're, when, when we get loud, they look frazzled. And, and what we noticed was when the, volume was the loudest and they were feeding young, they would fly down to the nearest brooding service berry, come back, and just start cramming these babies mouth full of this sugary fruit. And like any good sugar rush, the babies just kind of keel over. And <laughs> 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 they got very quiet in that nest cavity. And then the birds would go back to doing what they needed to do, which was get insect, because they were, all the baby birds always need fat and protein. That was interesting. What was really interesting was we were really lucky. We, we, we did this one year, and the next year there was a frost in late April when all the service berry were in bloom. And it killed all the buds. Mm -hmm. So there was no fruit that year. And since we were actually, we, we had a camera that could probe all these holes, and we had clutch data. It was fascinating. They all had five, well, they had six eggs the year before. And we had about 30 nests we were monitoring. And this year, when, when um, that frost hit and all those buds were killed, it was like they knew because they all laid one egg less. Every one of them. We compensate. And when they were feeding the young that year, by June, the bird, the adults were so bedraggled looking. They were really struggling. So I think service berry is a really important thing. We haven't tested that, but, but that seemed to be an important thing. So here's the adult. And you can see how they look a lot like these lichens. This is the back slide. And you can also notice how her shoulders are around that cavity. It's one of the smallest cavity entrances for a bird this size that we've seen. We, other woodpeckers make a much more generous hole than these guys do. And when we watch them come and go, they would literally struggle to get in and out. And we often wonder why. But it seems to be likely from predation pressure, and it's back to that squirrel I mentioned. And in the mountains, there's a, another one called the red squirrel. They have red squirrel, southern flying squirrels. And although they have northern flying squirrels, it's not a not in this ha uh, lower elevation, and so, um, and it's too rare, it's not a real problem. And he's fungus. But the, uh, the uh, southern flying squirrel, red squirrel, will eat eggs and baby birds. And so uh, we actually documented kills of adults and young in some of the cavities from the squirrels. Squirrels would also usurp their nest. They would work for a week to get this nice cavity done, to get it all smooth inside and everything, and then the next day there'd be a flying squirrel sleeping. <laughs> That's how, that's how it goes. So cavities are at a premium. Um, in a lot of places, they are here, especially in an urban setting, but they are out in the woods, too. I just want to mention this map because I mentioned that we don't know where all these birds are. We don't know where all the sap suckers are. We don't know where all the saltwood owls are. In the mountains, it's tough to get around. It's pretty rugged. One of the ways we get at these things is we, we do surveys and we measure the vegetation, species composition, and then all sorts of parameters. We feed that into the computer. We borrow vegetation data from places like the Forest Service. They have vegetation data from all over, or the Park Service. And then we have our bird location data with GPS. And, and using the GIS and the computer algorithms, it, we can essentially let the computer tell us where the birds ought to be where we didn't look. And that's what this map is. And there are different levels of confidence, gray being pretty much non-existent, and then one to four, four being the best. 
And the stars are where we found birds, and you have to also go to places where the birds aren't so you can compare. And the computer's telling us if we wanted to go look for the bird in other places, and you know, getting off the parkway here on one of these spur ridges can take some real effort. If we wanted to, then we would shoot for these purplish pink spots. We wouldn't waste our time, say, on the green ones, because we don't have that much money to be looking all over. And that's the sort of thing we try to do with this information, and we need to do, or we'll need to do more of it for these mountain birds. <clears throat> And so again, northern hardwood, it is a habitat of real concern, especially in the southern apps. So in preserving it, it's a complex problem because there's a lot of demand being put on it. Uh, right now, second homes and large developments are really popular at that elevation between, uh, say, 2,500 and 4,000, 4,500 feet. And then forestry practices, they're not necessarily bad, but they can be, depending on how they're done, but the factor is that it's a long rotation time for those oak trees to grow. It's, they're on a 60 to 100 year rotation, depending on what kind of wood you, you want to get or fiber out of it. So it's something that, it's hard to factor in that if you're, a, if you're a forester, you might see one event in your whole career in your life. And so when you're doing kind of management stuff, uh, North Carolina is blessed with having a lot of public land. But they also, but we, in the northern mountains, it's a lot of private. So there's going to be a lot of private public partnerships are going to be necessary to do conservation work for whatever, whether with birds, animals, plants. And these are being worked on, but they're going to have to continue and probably step it up a bit, too. Um, this is another bird. I call it the, uh, with northern aggression. I'm from the north, so I get away with that. Um, it's a tree swallow. It's related to Martin. And the reason that um, I mentioned the northern part is that it's a bird that came down from, expanded into North Carolina from the uh, north in about the 1940s. And then within 50 years or so, it had spread across the state. It's most common in the mountains. <clears throat> and then in the Piedmont areas, the coastal plain, it'll be found at large reservoirs and in places along the coast. So I call it fruit fly bird study because it's so common up north and it's so tame, it's easy to attract, it's easy to manipulate the way fruit flies are. And so a lot of people have studied tree swallows. <clears throat> it is a cavity nester, or it wouldn't be here in the talk. It is a secondary cavity user. So it relies on some of the smaller, medium-sized woodpeckers for a hole. There are other cavity nesting swallows in the state. We actually have cliff swallows who have moved in from the west. They build mud nests on the side of bridges now, and, it's, and then they uh, put the hole in the side. So they make a little dome with like an oven. The bank swallow builds nests where you would think in the banks of rivers. Rough wing swallows, that's the one I was mentioning, likes to nest in tractor trailer trucks that have been parked a little too long. It flies underneath them and goes into the holes, the drainage holes underneath. I see them in the, all the time. Otherwise, it will nest in mud banks like the um, bank swallow. And then, of course, everybody knows the purple martin. The, uh, <clears throat> the other reason I bring this up is that we actually have somebody here now in Boone at Appalachian State University, Lynn is doing work on tree swallows. And it comes back to the aggression thing. It turns out that females in the species show a lot of aggression, but it's variable. So where the variation you can try to measure, and that's what she's trying to do, her and her students. It's kind of interesting. I don't know the details yet, but she's coming in June to talk to Wake Audubon. So she's trying to look at androgen levels. That's a precursor to testosterone. And actually looking, trying to look into egg yolk. And then if she can measure it in the yolk and follow the babies, then they want to see if they can figure out if, if there are elevated levels that have changed the behavior of the bird. It sounds pretty wild. Um, I think it'll take 10 years for them to, to get an answer. But, but they just got started. And we, we typically mark our birds in different ways. Here's a bird that's color banded. So then you can see this bird in your binoculars or spotting scope and know who it is without catching it. Now, as far as the challenge goes, not really for the bird. They're common, they're adaptable, they're doing quite well. The challenge is for <coughs> bluebirds and bluebird enthusiasts because these birds have adapted quite well to what we call bluebird boxes. But it is a bluebird after all, so <laughs> it's only fair. Uh, that's why I don't like to use the word bluebird box. I do use the word nest box because there's so many species that will use these boxes. But there are a lot of people who get upset about something like this coming in. But interestingly, up in the mountains, we have a house up near Galax, and 
people around there put up these little gourds for the tree swallows. And they, are, they have a wonderful little sound, and they're just great to watch flying around. They're so aerodynamic. <clears throat> And then shift over to this guy, it's a little hawk or a falcon. It's a, a diurnal raptor called the American kestrel, the male on the left and the female on the right. This is another bird that breeds in the mountains, uses cavities, but it gets into the tree. It is the smallest North American falcon. And apparently it's declining in North Carolina, but that we don't really know. We don't really have it's another one where we don't really know that much about it. Uh, we have a lot of anecdotal observations, and now we're finding the birds are not where they used to be. So that, you know, they're either shifting or they're declining, but we're not finding them in new places, so it seems to be a decline, but don't really have good data. As I said, they're in the mountains. There's a little population that's isolated in the sand hills, mostly on Fort Bragg. Mm -hmm. And then in some Piedmont areas, which I'll mention a little bit more. So they like the forest edge, <clears throat> and they like the edges of fields, and so around farms, and then there's a number of them that they're adapting to the city life. Oh, well. So one way to get around, you know, again, so this is kind of like what Mark and Marilyn are doing with the owls. There's some folks who want to do boxes for the kestrels, so they've got an nest box program going in the mountains. This is a biologist at the Wildlife Commission putting up a box, and these are some baby kestrels. This is a brood that they did adopt the box, and they use it. They put up about a dozen boxes. I think they've had four or five that were adopted, the boxes. So that's going okay. It's a little bit harder to do in cities or in places where there's starlings because starlings will move in right away and out from keep. They're pretty aggressive. So they, um, in the, in, in the uh, city, the urban nest sites, they're in buildings with different sorts of things going on like drainage holes, old age, crevices, um, soffit openings, and here's one that I just found a couple weeks ago. I got a tip, got a hot tip, got a phone call, and if you look way over here, you see a little spot. And so if we look a little closer, and a couple weeks ago, there was a pair of kestrels going in and out of this little drainage hole. Now, I knew they were in the area because last year I'd seen babies over there at the post office, but I, it was too late, they were out in there. So I was pretty excited when somebody called and said, I'm seeing some falcons going in and out of the roof at Harris Teeter. I'll be right over. So I've been wanting to kind of monitor kestrels in the Raleigh area. So I was pretty excited uh, to get this on record. Here are some baby kestrels. They're sitting on top of the museum downtown. This was a few years ago. The woman that took this was in the building next door. She had her office next door, and she'd been watching these birds all spring. And we... Um, we're right next to the labor building. They've been nesting in the labor building for about a decade. And it's right where the soffit goes up, it joins the apex. There's a piece of the wood that came out. It's only a, you know, it's just a small cavity. It's big enough for a kestrel to get in up to the attic space, and that's where they've been nesting for years. So we've got that one. We've got the Cameron Village. Just down the road at the Cotton Mill Condo, there's been a pair nesting there for a while. They were nesting in a crevice where wall kind of separated. Same with this apartment building over behind the Kmart, which is right over here. Um, here at the condo, they repaired the building. But they told us, there was a woman there monitoring, she told us, we had a box, the workers were willing to hang the box, management approved it, and then starlings moved right in. And that's the problem with, with an urban setting with boxes. It's hard to get customers in without getting starlings. So the birds still seem to be around, so they seem to have found another spot. There was another spot behind our old office building where there was another crack in the soffit. It was also an old state building and the Kestrel went in and out of that for a few years. So it's interesting that they figured out a way to make a living. They eat small birds, rodents, and large insects. <clears throat> so yeah, here's a bird that's flying now. It's, this is over, this is the new building being built downtown, our new museum wing, and this is his wings. Um, but anywhere in a downtown urban area, the challenge we have is, do we want to maintain poor conditions of buildings? I don't think so. Um, so do you tell somebody that they've got this cool bird nesting and they look up and say, oh, that needs repair. And it's, always, it's a catch-22. And uh, But I'm, right now, nobody's looking, so we just keep monitoring and see how they do. I don't really have an answer to that yet, because the boxes are, are usurped by stars.
to shift over to uh, one bird, but mention three, not hatches, they're the upside down birds of the world. We have three species in North Carolina, and one is called white-breasted, and one is called red-breasted. These guys breed in the mountains up high the way the saw white owl does. They're kind of in the same habitat where the owls are. These guys are <clears throat> lower and all across the state. One thing they really are attracted to is white oak. The white oaks have this loose bark. These guys seem to have <coughs> taken over the white oaks of the world, and they forage under those loose bark, hanging bark chips and bugs. But the one I want to talk about is a cute little devil called the brown-headed nuthatch. And this is one that is a pine specialist. And yes, it eats insects, but it's good at getting little pine nuts, pine seeds out of pine trees. And this is interesting. They do a couple of interesting things. They seem to form, they form extended families. It's unusual in, in, in small birds, songbirds. There's another bird I'll mention. That. But they, they, will, they will have a brood, and then some of the young will hang around the next year while the next nesting takes place. Hmm. And although this forage is very high, they often use a cavity that's really low. So it's a good one where you can, if you can leave a low snag or if you can leave a, you know, a tree, if you have to, and I tell people, and I'll say it again, if you have to cut a tree down, if you can leave even 10 feet, a little downy will come in and make a hole, and then these guys will come in and use it the next year, a little downy woodpecker. So they will, they, they were always way up high, but they'll nest down low. I've found a number of them nesting really low. It just gives you, it's something then you can, you can help out by doing that. Um, there is a, it makes it sound to me like a little squeaky toy or rubber ducky. So if you have a little family of them moving through the pines um, up overhead, it's a really cute little sound and very, very, very diagnostic. The other interesting thing is in Florida, there's an isolated population. We've talked about that now several times. And there's one in Florida. It's just in the Sand Ridge in central Florida. And then there's one in the Bahamas. And most folks agree that one in the Bahamas is, is likely to be the best. These guys, it's, a, it's an urban bird that needs old pines and dead wood. And sometimes that's a hard thing to provide. Uh, old pines get knocked over in storms. So a lot of people, they get nervous by that. And they, they take a lot of trees down. Developments just take them down and replant, um, you know, really short things or, or brad repair, prey myrtle, and, and people aren't as enamored with pine. And uh, yeah, this is a bird that really needs them, along with some other things. But, um, and then dead wood. People don't want dead wood around. It falls on houses or cars. And so, um, but again, if you can, um, this is a good reason to leave some if you can, especially if you can top a tree, like I say, even a ten-foot trunk. These guys, all the nut hatches, will readily visit bird feeders and, and a bird bath. Uh, they like sunflower or suet, so you can bring them in that way. And again, here's a snag across the street from us. So it's across the street, and there's a, a there's a little lake right there. So we're lucky that we can leave this gigantic. I mean, you can see what happens to a cavity in Raleigh. It's going to get used all the lot. So this is another bird that does the extended family thing, and this is a federally endangered species, and famous or infamous, red cockade red cockade. It is a real specialist in, what we, in the long leaf pine savanna, and you've probably heard it uh, enough to make you ill, but I have to tell the story a little bit. So we've lost most of our long leaf pine, more than 80, 95% between southeast Virginia to eastern Texas. And it's a fire required habitat. So it's a habitat that has to have fire. This is a problem, uh, especially in light of things like what happened with in Colorado recently, where a prescribed fire, if it's called a controlled fire, gets out of control. And but fire is big business. And around here, the, the Division of Forest Resources and the Nature Conservancy spent a lot of time and money doing prescribed fires to maintain quality habitat for plants and the birds or animals that are in there. But these guys do also form these clans. It would be two to six birds. Just means they need a larger area because you've got a larger family. So these are young birds that will hang around and hang around the next year again when the nest gets going. I don't know that I finished. Yes, I did. So a lot of folks get confused about where the name comes from. This is it. That little thing is called a cockade, and that's a great cockade. 
So it's the males from the previous year who will stay behind to help out. See, we're not all so bad around the house. <laughs> <laughs> and then it turns out that some of the highest populations of this endangered species occur on our military bases. And that's because when you're doing military practices or then when you're doing ammunitions, you generate a little fire now and then. And it used to be they had to run around and put them, put them out. So we figured out that actually if you let it burn, you create this great habitat, and you're helping this endangered bird, that looks good for them, and it meant less fires had to put out. So now, Fort Bragg, for example, has one of the highest, dense, or one of the densest populations, one of the highest populations in the East, and so the Tampa Lejeune is doing pretty well too. Hmm. So it's a, it's a picky breeder. So whenever you're a picky breeder, you're going to be probably, you're probably going to be on an endangered species list. Um, in this case, these guys want to nest in old pine, generally 50 years or more. And, and the older the better. It could be a 70-year-old pine. That's what they like. And look, they're also using trees with the fungal heart rot again. Different fungus, but it's the same process. But unlike the sapsucker, which can excavate a cavity one to two weeks, these guys take one to three years. I don't know what takes them so long, but this is what's been measured. So uh, you've got, so that's a lot of energy. I mean, that takes, that takes a lot of time. So obviously, if a cab tree falls over, uh, you've got to start over. That could delay. Birds probably are always doing stuff in different stages. A lot of work. They have this one nest, but if you have multiple birds, each bird has its own cavity for roosting, sleeping. And notice how this cavity is surrounded by all the sap and stuff. That's done to dissuade predators. And that's been shown. Um, there are a number of cases where flying squirrel and black rat snake are stuck in that sap. <laughs> <laughs> that, it doesn't always work, but it does work. Now, sometimes pileated woodpeckers get in here and just blow this thing out. And then they got to go and start it. So a challenge, one big challenge, is maintaining fire anywhere. But even in this ecosystem, and you would think, well, it's not a problem, it's the military, they can do what they want. But they can't because they get a lot of complaints from neighbors you know, uh, about fire, about everything, actually. And so one of the solutions then is you can buy the adjacent property for buffering. And so now the Nature Conservancy has been aggressively pursuing that to get as many small properties around Fort Bragg as you as they can. And then you keep them or deed them over to the state, and they use them as buffers to be a, an area where when the fire hits, the fire stops there, not going into somebody else's house. Um, managing the property as well, because of the bird is so picky, it's, it, it's pine trees of a certain age. It can't be too thick either. And these are things that used to happen naturally, but not anymore, it requires management. And that means some thinning usually, or uh, and, and they're with wire grass and these other plants that go along. That kind of thing they like. Another thing that um, folks are doing is, pr is helping out with cavity excavation. Again, it's kind of like putting up a nest box. They, these guys don't use a nest box, but they will. It turns out, they will use a cavity that somebody else has started for them. And so somebody figured out. I think it was a student at Virginia Tech actually. They um, professor that used to be here at State moved to. Virginia Tech, and he's been doing RCW studies down on Bragg and Lejeune for many years. And so I think it's one of the students figured out that she could go up there and just took an auger and drill holes. And the birds started finishing the job. So they perfected the technique. And, um, you know, it's helpful because one of the challenges is that the habitats are fragmented now, and you've got areas where the birds used to be that are no more and you'd like the birds to be there. One way to get them there is the birds pick up and move. In other ways, you pick the birds up and move them. But then when they get there, you know, they're behind the eight ball, so let's help them out and get these, um, get these things going. So they have a way of putting in these starter holes and even throwing a predator guard for free. <laughs> so that's in the sand hills, and I'm gonna sh shift down into the coastal plain where uh, one of the loveliest little birds is found. It's not a rare bird, and, and it's great because one of the prettiest things to see, and they're not even that hard to find. They, they're, they're actually fairly, uh, well, I won't say tame, but almost tame when you walk through the woods in the right habitat. This is a prothonotary warbler. 
And I love the name, and most people do too, even though we don't have a clue. But we do have a clue, actually. It gets its name from uh, old uh, sect, the clerks. It was, a, it was a Roman Catholic group. Anyway, they were called proto-notaries, and they wore yellow robes. So the person that first named this bird back in the 1800s knew that and gave him that name. I think so. Yeah, it was a priest. And so I think it's a wonderful name, application. So it's a voluntary work. It is one of two cavity nesting warblers in the U.S. There are over 40 species of warblers in the U.S. <clears throat> one of them builds a, a dome and a side entrance, so it's kind of like a cavity. It's making own in vegetation, but it's like an oven. It's called an oven bird. But in a, in a wood cavity like this, there's only two. One is called Lucy's warbler. It's out west. It's kind of gray and white. Um, so this guy is a real spectacular one, in the, and this is the eastern one. It's a migratory bird, and the locals will call it swamp canary. And, and it is it's a forested wetland bird. It really, it really does like to be in wet areas, and so we find it pretty commonly along our larger rivers like PD, the Lumber, Roanoke, Cape Fear. So female and some vegetation. <clears throat> But unlike some of these other warblers, it only does one brood a year. Most of the songbirds will do two or even three. These guys seem to form multi-family clans or groups. We, uh, we, were, we were studying birds on Roanoke and on the PD, and different birds, but these were commonly around. We watched them a lot, they would catch them a lot while we were trying to catch the other birds. And they, um, when they're done breeding, they seem to just get into these neighborhoods things and get together. It was interesting. The, the, you can tell a male that's over than, older than two years from a male that's only two years old. And one thing we discovered was that older males are heading out by late July. We stopped seeing them. I presume they're heading south, but they may have just been going somewhere else to do a migration or to fatten up before they left. But they left our study site by late July. And actually, some folks in Central America told me that they, they start seeing some of these migrant birds by late July and early August. So it was a real surprise to see that they hadn't had not they're not waiting for fall. They're at them. They're done. They're done. And the uh, but the females and the young males would hang around with these young birds because we would like I say we would catch fifteen birds at a time and they only laid three to four eggs, so it couldn't have been just one pair. It was several of them and they'd hang out in the woods together. And they would hang out into August. They would those birds would be in So they do use next boxes and they actually will use milk cartons. So some folks on the milk cartons that I stopped, uh, you know, I actually I had taken that O out and it put it back in. It did a spell check on me and I didn't catch it. It put it right back in and I didn't catch it. Um, the uh, folks there are folks in uh, at Virginia Commonwealth, there was a fellow there who just retired, but he'd been studying these for years on the eastern shore. And that was his thing. He'd run out every year with just 100 milk cartons and put them up, and these birds happily move in. And then he could do whatever he was doing to study. We declared it was a Wake Audubon bird of the year in 2009. We tried to do celebrations of things with different birds. There's one nest cavity here. Um, I'd say, as far as the challenge for these guys, well, they like to be over standing water, and that's to keep, surely to keep predators out, especially snakes from climbing up, because rat snakes are such good climbers. And so a drought year is going to be a problem, or if it's a drought caused by anthropogenic things, and there are a lot of, there's a lot of competition for water, so for hydroelectric, recreation-based stuff, water management is going to require a lot of compromise. Along the road, and we're always um, being asked to contribute data salt on the, um, there are multiple dams, they're both for hydroelectric and one for uh, gas in a car lake for recreation. So there's a lot of conflict there, and it's just going to require a lot of compromising to help with uh, these issues. I'm going to move offshore, taking it from the coastal plain right offshore, so it's, it's a lot of water now, and there are issues. These are some seabirds, they're called petrels, so this is the black cat petrel here. And a Bermuda petrel, I know they look alike, and believe it or, but believe it or not, they are they are different. 
The Bermuda petrel is aptly named. It, it breeds only on Bermuda. The black cat's petrel is on currently on Hispaniola. It used to be on some other islands, but was wiped out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bermuda petrel, sometimes called the cow. Here's one at a burrow. <clears throat> so what happened was, about the turn of the century, they weren't being seen anymore until they were declared extinct. And then somebody rediscovered them about 1950. There were 18 pairs on a little island, a little islet uh, off Bermuda. So the fellow that was a conservation officer, David Wingate, began a program of doing artificial furrows. But what was happening was other things would get in, the way starlings get in here. Down there, they got this beautiful bird, their national bird, called a white-tailed tropic bird. But it was getting in and knocking the petals out. So they had to come up with a way to keep those guys out, and they came up with this oval hole. It's kind of similar to what we do with purple martin boards now to keep starlings out. And this kept other birds out and things out. And it's actually, I think it's got a screen that so keeps the rats out too, and then the, the birds get in. And so I just got an email a couple days ago, and they're up to 101 pair. Mm -hmm. Which is, which is, you know, it's amazing. It's been going on since the 50s, but um, you'll see why. It takes so long. Occasionally they are seen offshore. There's a fellow that does bird watching tours out of Hatteras and out of Manio, and they occasionally see the bird offshore. There's a new technology called geolocator. You can put a device on a bird, let it go, it flies around, it records sunlight and time of day and stuff, and then you can you can get that geolocator back and download it and do some um, do the, run the program. It'll tell you where the bird was. And they did that recently with some of these guys because we didn't know anything about what they do when they leave for It turns out they were flying up to Newfoundland mm -hmm. in that area, and some were going all the way across the Atlantic to the Azores. But the uh, birds were flying up and back, foraging on up to Newfoundland and back. And you'll see that's, no, that's another pattern with the black cat petrel, different location, but about the same bit. So I'll switch over to black cat petrel and. <clears throat> It was a similar story. It was presumed extinct by the early 1900s. These birds, they nest on these normally isolated volcanic type islands. When people started landing, they would just eat the bird. The birds were not uh, afraid because they'd never seen a human. They'd never seen a cat or a dog or a rat. So all these things ended up on these islands and just destroyed most of the breeding colonies. And so this bird was thought to be extinct. But then, um, so David Wingate just wanted to do some uh, looking around, and he found some on Hispaniola, on the island of Hispaniola in the mid-60s. My former boss, uh, about a decade later, was given a lot of money to do offshore studies and found a whole lot of them feeding offshore. So then people were like, ah, oh, they must be really common, and we just missed them all this time because nobody had gone off North Carolina coast looking for them, or looking for anything, except some fishing. In the mid-80s, a fellow went back to Haiti, found another colony in the southwest part of the country. And things were looking kind of good, but no work has been done on land. We don't know, any, we don't know anything about the bird. Nobody, uh, it's hard to work in Haiti, and I don't think anybody, just, nobody wanted to go. <laughs> so I'll come back to that in a second, but I just want to point out, so I was mentioning how in Bermuda they're flying up off the Bermuda petals going up here. Well, Turns out black cat petrels, they're nesting here, and they're flying up off Hatteras here. Mm. But another colleague of Dave's was doing survey work, so they were both doing it, and they finally got stuff plotted recently, and this is just seasonal stuff. But the main thing is look where the colors are, so here's North Carolina and South Carolina, Georgia, so the petrels are here. When they get to North Carolina, they're out on the continental shelf. You know, here they are, here they are, and here. And they seem to skip this spot here, you see this right there. And then here they are again. So in all seasons where they occur, okay, there's certain spots where they are. <laughs> Off North Carolina, that spot right there, it's also where a lot of fishing goes on because it is the Connell Shelf, but it's also where people want to drill for oil and gas and that sort of thing. So you know, a lot of whales migrate there. So the uh, petrel breeds, again, it's on, it's mostly in Haiti. We only know of the nest site out here in the park nest site here in the park and then along the border here. I think they're over in Cuba too, um, based on some recent observations. But recently, so I've been part of some of this work, I've been able to go twice. I've had grant money to send some a colleague down and he's been working with some locals. And recently they found several new areas with the birds, which is pretty exciting. 
Um, what's not so exciting is that they're mostly in Haiti. <coughs> and that's why I put that in red. It's just really hard to be a uh, bird in Haiti. <coughs> we think there's probably no more than 5,000 birds. But we don't really know. It's kind of hard to uh, measure these things. So they, um, I'm going to mention some of their breeding biology that relates to the Bermuda petrel too. And I say up here, I say as I see it because we don't know for sure. That's the problem. So we infer, based on what we know of other species, there's another endangered species called the Hawaiian petrel. We know a lot about it because people have been studying it for 30 years. These guys breed, they, so they, they make burrows. That's the cavity part. They make burrows on the side of the cliffs. They only come at night. <clears throat> they often nest and lose colonies of birds. So if you find a couple birds, you're going to find usually a dozen. They excavate these burrows on steep slopes, and they're pretty high elevation. So the black cap, the Bermuda's at sea level, but the black cap is above 5,000 feet. And I'm sure they occur lower, but there is no. They, they uh, have to be in forested slopes, and there's no forest left in the uh, below. There's just a couple of parks where there's some forest. They only lay one egg, and because of the length of time for incubation and raising the young, especially because what happens is the adults will leave for a week at a time and come back and feed the guy, and then leave for a week and come back. So it takes a while to grow up. So it's about, it's about a seven-month cycle. Best we can tell from, well, we, we have information on when they get started and we, uh, when some young birds were found in port of prince they hit lights. So they may only breed every other year, I'm not sure. And it takes five years for them to reach maturity. That's based on other petrels of the same size. Hmm. They will also use existing crevices. So that was the reference to uh, not only petrels in a building crevice, but these guys will use a crevice like this one here on some rocky slopes. They will, in fact, use small caves. So a nest was found, first documented active nest. We found a, we found a bird in a crevice like this in 2002 but we watched it for a few days. It didn't lay an egg or do anything. It may have been a young male just prospecting, but just a year and a half ago, they finally found guys working um, from the Dominican side came over and they found a, an active nest. And it was in a small cave. And this is the first chick ever documented, black cat petrel, the first. Now it was documented by the early mariners who came and ate the thing. They didn't take photographs in 1550. Um, this is the first photograph chick like that. That's pretty cool. That was exciting. Um, I've been working with Jim at Cornell, and he's the one I sent a couple of times. It was, and these, the guy came over, he's been work, came over from Holland to work with folks in the Dominican side and then with some of the Haitians, and it's really exciting. They found this, um, this first active nest and got all the great stuff. The birds. They found two, one of the young fledged, the other disappeared, but now the birds, the birds came back this fall, so they're doing it again. They are very faithful to their nest site. They live about 30, 40 years, and they will come back to the same burrow year after year. And so, you know, the, working in Haiti is, is tricky. Uh, obviously, they're really poor, and they're really hungry, and they don't, you know, they're not going to respect park boundaries when they're dying of hunger. So what Jim is trying to do is actually work with folks working with the locals to get resources to them and alleviate their poverty a bit, which hopefully will alleviate the stress on the park and help the bird that way. Because it's, it would be impossible to just put up some kind of boundary to keep the people out of that park. I wanted to mention uh, one other thing about it. It was interesting from the work that Dave did. So part of what he was doing, too, he thought the birds were pretty common. and we. We often study plumage as a thing in one way, is to hunt a few birds and come back and study them at the museum, and he did that. And what, uh, these are some live birds that were in Haiti that were caught, you can attract them to uh, life. <coughs> and, um, but what they did was, he noticed that this face, these guys are dark right here, but he noticed some were light, whiter. And he wondered about that, but he didn't follow up. Recently, a guy did follow up, and he found that that facial pattern also correlated with the way they molt, which is when they change their feathers. So it was two strong hints that something was going on out there. And here's a bird that's more white on the face. And again, 
they seemed different. So then a colleague came up from the University of Wilmington, a student, they took towpad samples off of the birds we have, and they were able to extract some DNA. And darn it, they didn't find some genetic differences that matches this plumage and mold thing. And that's pretty amazing. So that implies that there's two breeding populations out there, so we don't know where the other one is. Although some birds are being seen now over off Dominica and Guadalupe, where they had been 100 years ago, so maybe they've been, maybe there's a few of them that survived all this time. And that's pretty exciting. Although, it just means now there are half as many of, of each bird. And so, to, to do conservation on a bird like this, it's international, involves Haiti, involves offshore, it's going to be pretty challenging. And we have energy development, fisheries, plastic pollution is huge, light is a problem when you do energy development, you have these um, you know, light things out there, and the birds run into light, and then there's mercury all over. Um, we can protect some foraging areas. I think we're going to have to do that, set them aside as ocean parks. That will help for fishing as well. Uh, the fisheries industry has been I think, poorly managed most, uh, most everywhere, so we're going to have to tighten up there. And I guess that's really, uh, and again, the lighting thing. And then Hope for, hope for the best. All the petrels are in dire shape due to, due to all these. And then on the island, when you have rats, cats, or things like mongoose introduced. Um, and I think, um, and I don't need to do this if we, this is you know, the last thing, but we don't need to go through this if you want to just say we're done. I don't know how long it's been. Do you want to hear about these guys? I think 45. I think it's a video to share. Well, the uh, chimney swift is a fairly well-known bird in this area. And I like this little quote that my colleague John Connors at the museum found. So in 1682, a swift was found nesting for the first time in a chimney in a colonist cabin in Maine. So we actually have that document. <coughs> This event forever changed the relationship between this species and people. So this bird is now pretty much dependent on human-made structures. It's given a, it used to roost and nest in big old hollow trees, and they just they just don't exist anymore. A few, like on the Black River or the Kiwi where we were, uh, some, but for the most part, they're just in artificial structures. So there's a common sight. Uh, around here, they just returned what we know as the flying cigar. They do look like a cigar with wings. They are built for flight. Indeed, they cannot perch like a regular bird. They can only perch vertically. Hmm. They are the fast. They've been. They are the fastest horizontal flyers. People know about peregrines diving, but in sustained horizontal flight, swifts, not the chimney. Um, they haven't been measured, but a European one that's been clocked, an Asian one. They um, are the fastest. It's a power flight. And the Asian swiftlet species, they're the ones that are responsible for the bird's nest soup, which is just swift spit. <laughs> so you take a swift, you take their nest, and you soak it in water, and you get kind of stuff, their spit out of it, and that's what they make the bird's nest. And you pay big bucks for that. <laughs> so looking at the ranges of widespread bird all across eastern U.S., southern Canada. They migrate to the tropics, but this belies um, what we really know, because we don't really know. They return from the Amazon basin in early April. They've just gotten back just about a week ago. We don't fully understand the migratory route. We don't fully understand the winter rain. But what appears to happen because when, when swifts go to the tropics, there are a lot of other swifts down there that look like chimney swifts, and you have to know the birds. So there are local folks who do. What they tell us is that they see chimney swifts coming down the west side, on the Pacific side of South America, and then later they will see them over on the east side. So it appears that they actually go and stage for a while and move over the Andes and move down into the Amazon base. But we have very little data on their biology and on their winter ecology. The status, well, it's kind of alarming. It's actually a bird. It's so we're so used to it, so ubiquitous, but yet it's declining at an alarming rate in many parts of its range, and that's what the red is. The red is 
um, like 2% per year, <coughs> including parts of North Carolina, but mostly up here. So, and then some places here. So it's become a really rare bird in New England, for example. It's still fairly common in North Carolina, but we'd like to, we'd like to keep it that way. <coughs> and they're nesting, so as I said, they are now pretty much dependent on artificial structures. This is a nest. It's kind of a half moon. They, they glue the sticks to the surface. It's one pair for a chimney when they're nesting. But they're not really territorial in that because they're aerial foragers. So they're all up there flying around just catching as catch can. And they'll, you know, they'll nest in a house here and a house here and a house here, but not more than one for chimney. It's four to seven eggs in a clutch. And they have, uh, the problem for homeowners is that they hatch asynchronously. And they're very loud. And of course, you've got a chimney that resonates. So that's a, 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 we, we get a lot of calls there. They are, they're very busy in late June and July. And they're, the young take 21 days before they can fly. But when, when you have young that hatch a week later than the first one, then you've got swifts in your chimney for a But if you have swifts and you're willing to tolerate them, you can block the bottom with just a big, thick pad of foam and you won't hear them. And the nest itself is not really a uh, fire hazard. <clears throat> More often, the birds fall down and people get a little bit or because there's this chimney that's coming through the flue. They often build the nest really low, right above the flue. The birds will fall down sometimes. But remember their feet are built to climb sideways. Mm -hmm. They can't perch like this. They can only do this. So they're very much like a piece of Velcro. So if you just, and, and they're docile little birds. So if you have one in the bottom of your chimney, you just pick it up and reach up and just stick it to the side. <laughs> <laughs> and it will grab instinctively and it will just crawl right back up. <laughs> Now, it turns out that, so this is kind of getting back to the wireless thing. So housing after 1995 doesn't really support Swiss because they change the line in their chin. If they make a chimney, it's a real chimney because usually it's like a gas log thing, but if they make a real one, there's a liner in there that the Swiss cannot cling to. So we, um, you know, here again, we, you know, we, we didn't intentionally invite this bird in, but the bird came in, adopted us, and now, the technological change, and we're losing habitat based on an improvement to our, our houses. It's just kind of a weird thing to think. And then schools. So schools have been a big roosting location for swifts. They have bigger chimneys. Now there's something about their behavior I'm going to show you where they get together in big roosts before they migrate. Thousands of birds, so they depend on big chimneys. Schools were great. We, we were surveying Back in the late 90s, we had 33 schools in Wake County with big old colonies of squibs. It was great. And uh, then, they, then we all voted to uh, a bond to improve our schools and our HVAC system, and it, um, we expelled the Swiss from school because they put in a different liner and the Swiss can't use it anymore. We also told a few um, superintendents what a great thing they had, and they kind of freaked out. They're like, we don't want those around here. They can't do it. Uh, that was Kind of like the Kestrel, do I tell or do I not? So, um, so Wake Audubon, the museum. I saw you know, John and John Connor and I are both at the museum and on the Wake Audubon board. So we've been doing a lot of education, trying to affect some conservation with chimney swifts. We did a science cafe last fall. <clears throat> um, we're taking groups out to do these swift Sundays in September. We'll be doing them this fall. There's a roost site downtown. I can show you at the end here if it works. On, the, on YouTube. Um, so what are all those people looking for? They're looking for this, because there's this pre-migratory roosting behavior that these birds do. After they're done nesting in late July, or early August, they all start to gather up. They have to molt, they have to fatten up. The young ones have to figure out how to make a living. And they're out and about in big conglomerations. They come back they, to a big chimney in the evening. And they, uh, so they need a big one. So they need chimneys for nesting and roosting, but they're different chimneys. So we are, uh, last year was great, this year we're going to do it again. Every Sunday in September, around 6 o'clock, we'll meet over by the um, District Museum Park, that parking lot on the other side. Uh, you can check the Wake Audubon website if you're interested, just to get the details, it'll be, it'll be there. Um, at one chimney, the one downtown, I had up to, at one time in about the third week of September, I had about 8,000 birds going in. They come in at sunset, and they just start swirling, and it's fantastic. 
torn, like a little tornado coming in, and then somebody flushes and they just start going in, and, just, and it goes, and it just start getting to be dark too. This is an exhibit I helped put together at the museum to show what it probably looked like in an old tree uh, years ago. But you can see how their long, narrow wings are. They've got these stiff tails with little points on them for propping up against the surface. <clears throat> So we're fundraising now. We've actually got a buy a brick campaign going, and we've sold a couple hundred. It's an inscribed brick. We're going to make a. We're fundraising for a roof tower uh, out at our um, Prairie Ridge site, which is just over here somewhere, not far away. We're going to put it up. We want to get one that could hold five or six thousand birds, <clears throat> and then on, underneath will be a patio with these bricks. We'll use it for education. We'll also be able to do research. People like me can harass these birds. <laughs> you know, put some of those geolocators and that sort of thing on them. It'll, a couple of years from now, there'll be GPS data loggers. We won't even need the unit back. We'll just sit at our computers with a cup of coffee and download data from the satellite. So there are lots of questions and about SWIFT. We still don't know. I won't get started. Take too much, but uh, it is time to get started answering some of these questions. And that's what we hope to do by getting this, uh, getting this thing going. We have a Frank Harmon here, NC State, donating services to get the thing designed. And, um, we submitted a grant to do to, to get some more funds to get it going, and also to do education with some of the Wake County schools. Here is uh, here's a picture of uh, what one of the chimneys looks like with the birds funneling in. Some artwork that we did. On, uh, in the last fall, John and I were part of a program that National Geographic Wild does, some kind of wildlife scene, crime scene investigation. And there was something, some kind of noise in somebody's attic and they wanted to investigate. So they came to North Carolina and part of it was to look at chimney switch. And it aired last Saturday, but I was told it's gonna air again on cable, channel 254. I don't have cable, so I know nothing about this. Time Warner. I think it's called Noise in the Attic. It's something like that. Do you remember? Is that it? And it's a Nat Geo Wild channel. And I, it, last time it was 10.30 when it showed. I presume it would be the same. Apparently we're in it for like 30 seconds. And the important part is that they got great footage of the chimney swift. They got some really great, they got some footage I don't think anybody's ever gotten. And that is, we took them up on this roof and um, Actually, if you want to click on this, it might pull up and, and show, it'll show the chimney that we were at. We took them up there so they could get this great, their own footage, really good stuff. And they took two infrared cameras and put them down the chimney. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody's ever done that.
down his work today? Yeah, he did really support it. He thinks this is really cool. Yeah, he owns several restaurants. Um, where they I know we could charge a big fee to take people up there, serve them a bowl of wine, you know, have a night out with the Swift. <laughs> He's very nervous about it. But anyway, so that's, um, I guess what I'll do, you have to That was great. These are a lot of the folks that I got pictures from, and I appreciate all of that. Um, I put together a real quick list here right before I came over, just to give you an idea of what goes on in North Carolina, different cavity users. Uh, I probably missed a few because I was just doing this off the top of my head while I was finishing up a cup of coffee and getting ready to come over. These, of course, are Purple Martins. We're going to be putting in a Purple Martin complex, or a complex here at the Arboretum. Tim Francis does that around Wake County. He's going to put one in. Maybe in a year or two, we'll have some from the faculty club move over. Because I think they're always looking for a new home. Um, so these are just a bunch of the birds that are in North Carolina, they use some different sort of cavity. There's me at my own cavity. It's a man, my man cave. <laughs> <laughs> this great. is a uh, big old cypress tree in South Carolina. And there were Swiss, it's hollow. There was a bigger bat in there. Um, there were Swiss flying around it a lot. I think they actually might have been using this now and then to either nest or, or sleep, but I was never out there at night. <laughs> so thanks again for coming out. If you have any <laughs> questions. <laughs> study in the 12 county region looking at home house construction and that's what he found was that about 95 things changed and it's changing so there's you know it's habitat decreasing so I think if you take it off they're likely to come back and make it out right away but years. yeah okay and you know the problem with what most people ran into is not the Swiss when we talk to people about it it's the other things that come down the chimney not Santa Claus but the squirrel the raccoon People tolerate the squid, but they just don't want to deal with a raccoon or a squirrel. And I understand that. Um, but you can, um, we're, we were trying to think of a way of uh, an easy design. You could put it up in the spring, take, uh, or take it down the spring, put it up in the fall. <laughs> Nothing really easy. Um, some folks have done, they will come in sideways. So there is a design where you can have a cap over the top and the birds will come in sideways. We're trying to find out if it's really working. Snakes won't go up. I don't know of any snakes going up chimney. It's just squirrel and raccoon. Have y'all had that? Uh, a neighbor has a black snake going. Okay. It's just they, they can, but it's such a rare thing. I don't know why, but they they just don't seem to do it much. They go up trees all the time. But I haven't heard many going up chimney. But yeah, I think they you know they they would they would appreciate it. What kind of yeah. birds would you have to have? I have a one of my five five story oak trees approximate to a chimney that I could take a cap off of but I believe it's maybe 15 to 18 feet from the tree, and then there's the tree canopy overhead. So how much clearance do they See, need? that's the interesting thing. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if anybody's done direct measurements to see what their tolerance is for the canopy. We've seen them go into, we've seen them go into some tight spaces. We're, we, we live pretty close, and I think Sean has those big trees, and they, they, go, they go around those and into his chimney. So I, I don't know exactly. I, I think something really close is going to be a problem, but I think all you'd have to do is, I mean, all you could do is try it. Nobody really has any data on that. It'd be interesting to find out. We've often wondered. I lived with Swifts on, um, on my former house on Claremont Road. I was right back to uh, Free Creek. Okay. And they're great, <coughs> except for waking up at 3 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you need to put the phone thing in. At, in, right below, you know, at the door, if you have the door, you just get one of those thick three inch, four inch pieces. It'll block, you won't hear them. But oh, I just so them. The babies are so them. Yeah. Uh, if a dead tree or branch uh, has to come down to an habitat portion, <coughs> reattached to an adjacent tree, 
I think so. Um, a, a colleague of mine will make things out of pieces of branches. He'll actually do the, he'll get it started and hang them up and have things, use them, finish them off. So I would think that, I would think it would work. I have a, I have a piece of pine that fell down that had a woodpecker nest in it. I've been using it as a doorstop in my office, but I'm actually going to try that. I'm going to take it home and um, somebody cut it top and bottom, but they they brought me the whole nest, the whole thing. So I'm just going to the bottom's uh, closed off, but it just needs a top. I'm just going to put a piece of wood on top and hang it up, wire it to a tree, and see what happens. See if somebody comes in, because I'm sure it will. The other thing that I like are flying squirrels. I do like them. So I have six or seven boxes in the yards. And in part because I, I want to have one out there for the squirrel, they're just a little. So they will they might move into something like that. Yeah. In one of your last slides, you mentioned um, the flycatcher as being an S cavity user, and I'm just curious as to which flycatcher. If I had a flycatcher in there, it would have been great crested flycatcher. So it would have been pretty high up. But they mainly stay in the, the, the canopy of the trees. Yeah, but they will come down. So I had this box uh, on the very first slide. The very first slide. I don't know if you saw down the lower right. There was a little bird with the wire mesh around the opening, and it was sticking its face out. That was a baby gray crested flycatcher. That box I put up with a ladder. I think it was 12 feet up. So they will come down, down to 12 feet. I've heard of people say they'll come a little lower too to hit boxes. They just need a little bit bigger hole. If you have a bluebird box, that's not big enough. It needs to be about an, at least an eighth or if not a quarter inch more. So what happened on that box was that the squirrels had chewed the opening, but it wasn't big enough for the squirrel to get in, but it was big enough for the flight catcher to get in. Eventually the squirrel got in, but it took him like two years for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> so it was enough. He, he just wasn't that interested. He was just kind of, I think, well, I'm supposed to chew on something, so I will. <laughs> but that, those birds nested there for a couple of years. Is that wire to keep flying squirrels out? Is which? The wire mesh. There he is, right there. You know, that that is. Um, but it didn't work. It worked for maybe a year, and then they figured out how to go around it. and. I think, you know, you're maybe it's got the little prong. Well, this one did. This got the prongs there, but um, the little, they figured out how to get around. I just put that on about eight bluebird boxes, <clears throat> hoping to keep the flying squirrel away. I think, I think it'll dissuade them. That's very depressing. Because this was, the, these were gray, this was a gray squirrel that got in. Oh. Yeah, it was hilarious. He finally figured it out. I had three, went around to each one and chewed them out. Oh each one. So really the best thing I think is just buy those there's metal plates you can buy that have a hole in it. That's yeah, the best to keep thing. The, the big square. Yeah. But it'd be you know one thing I will say about these, birds love these like a front porch. <laughs> the the um the fly catcher and the and the we have tough the tip mice usually nesting these. And they just they'll just late in the day they'll just be sitting there. And they truly <laughs> look like they're just uh, and they just want a beer and they just want to sit on the porch. And they do, they just sit on that thing and it's hilarious. Yeah, she's, yeah, it's hilarious. They did. The metal, metal plate thing. Uh, you know, somebody sent me a link. I saved it, but I don't remember where it was online, I think. It might have been one of the bird stores also. I think what I would do is I would call, like I deal with, uh, Folks up in Stonehenge, there's an outdoor bird company. I would just call Don or Karen and describe it. I'll bet you they can find it. Because that's that. somebody sent me a link and said, hey, this is what you're looking for. And it was. I didn't do anything about it because I currently have all my boxes with them on. But I, I remember thinking, great resource. But yeah. Or just call Don and, and she can find it. There's a couple of wild birds in the minutes still around, too, and they can probably find it. They're out there. Yeah? Uh, about the sap suckers. Yeah. It looked like their holes were vertical. Mine are horizontal. I knew somebody was going to notice that. <laughs> I know, I'm sitting there today going, I, bet I should change the slide. I should oh. change the slide. Somebody's going to, yeah, I should have rotated at 90 degrees. Somebody would have noticed that too. Somebody that knows. 
graphics would have noticed that. Um, you're right. They um, they normally are horizontal, mm -hmm. and they do. Uh, they they apparently can get at two parts of the tree. So there's like the cambium part. There's a phloem thing, and the uh, vertical ones are referred to as phloem wells. And but most of the time, they, they are horizontal around here because in the winter they just do the horizontal. But on the when they're breeding, in that picture I took up on their breeding grounds. And so they do both horizontal and vertical on the breeding ground. So we, we, could, we could tell if we had, if we were in an area and I thought it was, there were some areas I wasn't sure if there was a bird and if there was, and when I found sap well, that there was some migrant or a breeder. But if I found vertical wells, I was pretty sure there'd been a breeding bird in the area at least once upon a time. So yeah, good, good spot, good notice. I don't remember why they do the phloem wells, I forget why. Somebody had looked into that up in the north. Um, yeah. Are there a lot of affiliated woodpeckers in this area? Well, there aren't a lot, but they're here. And the reason there aren't a lot is because they occupy such a large home range. I forget, somebody out west did some telemetry on the birds. <clears throat> and you know, it's square miles that they go. So if a pair and, and they always overlap, because if you're at one end of a mile territory and your neighbor sneaks in, you're not going to know. So all these birds overlap. But when you just physically, when you're occupying a lot, then you can only have so many on the landscape. I've heard uh, at least two different pairs at Umstead, and I, I'm sure there's a couple more. That's 1,500 acres. And, uh, but I bet you there's not more than three or four pairs in that whole park. We've seen some carrots out in this black horse run, which is up creek and road. Uh huh. Um, I mean, they're incredible. <coughs> they are fantastic. And you know what is interesting is that so they feed on pans and uh, termites, but especially on these carpenter ants, whatever, the big ones. So they, they are often on the ground or on a fallen log on the ground. Mm -hmm. And they just hammer the thing, it just blows it apart. Mm -hmm. um, but they also, they're tolerant of some fragmentation, so some urban areas, as long as there's enough cover, tree cover. Because obviously they need a big enough bowl to nest in. Mm -hmm. So there has to be some large trees, which means older trees. And they like a certain amount of cover. But if you've got, so let's say you have, you know, a 10 square mile area. If you've got, say, 50% coverage, then that's enough. I forget what the cutoff is, but mm -hmm. above that, even if there's a bunch of houses underneath or grass lawns or whatever, you'll have probably able to So, yeah. So they are in, they are all across the state and they are in a number of urban areas. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations for resources for plants for birds? Oh, well, I just gave that talk on Tuesday <laughs> <laughs> to the Raleigh Heterocala Society, or the of the club. Um, you know, Yes, yes. We have, there's several publications. One that NC State Co-op put out years ago, or Ag Experience, the Extension Services, when Chris Mormon was in charge, because I helped him with it. And it's still, it's still available. And then um, I could get you something from the museum. We have a fellow that did all this stuff for schools, for butterfly and bird plantings for schools. And compiled a nice list. And um, I have it on my hard drive, actually. So I guess if I, you know, if I had your email, I could, um, I could get you some, I could get you. So, and you know, the Bot Garden, they do a lot of native stuff that's got, that a lot of times geared towards breeding things for birds. And they have some information on their website. There's a, you know, there's a fair amount of stuff now um, on that topic. And you know, might pick things that were good for fruiting, fruit good for birds, but also things that people could grow without too much trouble. Some things are good about birds. So for this area, I I got what do we I don't even know how many we've got anymore in that little plot of our front got planted so many shrubs now, but they they uh, you know if you did beauty berry and some ilex, and I don't worry about Male, female, because there's so many Ilex around, somebody's going to pollinate somebody. I, I just, I end up with females, but somebody's got a male somewhere because they get, they get free. 
and, and by burns, the fruit, or some of it, and dogwoods. They do. Bring in, and I, people don't like to hear me say this, but Pope Barry is one of the best mm -hmm. plans you can have. You just have to manage it. You have to manage it. It gets out of control. But the birds, the birds sit on a poke and they wait for it to ripen. Wait for it to But I could get you some information. Because I do, I do give talks on that. Let's see if Chris could arrange a trip for us, too. Might so have I was to. About the, the wholesale nursery you mentioned earlier, they might. If you, if you all wanted house. to do that, then yeah, you could. You know, you could just tell Bill your, that I sent you or that Mike done because Mike's his neighbor, and uh, Mike's the guy who did the list that I was telling you about. I, I've got these PDF files of his, and, and uh, yeah, just tell him that we. That you have a club and you're looking to do some native planting. He'll let you come out, and uh, stuff is. You should buy the stuff yeah. this tall. Sure. Ten dollars. Yeah. Woody, Woody's, you know, harder to find. Yeah. Again. Yeah, it's great. It's good. It's a sure nursery. nursery. And he usually does wholesale. He does DOT mitigation. Sure. But he's got a ton of uh, mostly wetland type trees and shrubs. They're really good. Yeah. 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 Up Redbud Lane there. Up 15 Pablo. We went this fall and took our garden to live out this morning. So, he, he, I think he gets a kick out of having the clubs come He said we could come back anytime. <laughs> Tell him I sent you. Took him out of work. Well, if there's no more questions, John, why don't you go ahead and do a plug for your building opening? Tell us what kind of event you have coming up. Oh. If you have a minute or two. Oh. I know you have quite a few activities. You know, there's so much going on. I am not exactly sure. They're expecting 50,000 people. It will start Friday at 5. It will run 24 hours, Saturday to 5. And indoor, outdoor. They're, they're just trying to have just trying to have us stationed all over the place and talk to people as they come through. I know my throat's going to be so sore. Um, <laughs> A new building, you know, it would have to be guided because, you know, through, because there'll be so many people, you won't be able to just totally linger. But the other, the old building will be open, the new one, and then all these booths and things set up outside for festivities and things. So I'm actually, I'm actually, yeah, doing stuff for the museum, but also for um, Wake Audubon, because we'll have a table outside and we're doing stuff for the chimney switch. So I got to do both. Lucky you, right? I know. <laughs> it did seem which, far away. I was telling someone earlier today <laughs> about our discussion last which, year. Which Friday is that, Tom? It is April 20th. So it's week coming week up. Week. Yeah. yeah, you know, a year ago, I think they were going to open it up earlier or something, and then they pushed it back. Yeah, I didn't think it would be like next week. It, wasn't, it was supposed to be done already. <laughs> That's how state construction goes. They're actually not ready. Um, they're ready enough, but they'll have to do some more construction for a few weeks to finish up some loose ends, which is pretty tough. I mean, you just have to, at a certain point, you just got to say, time to go. But it's going to be pretty wild. There's a lot of uh, technology and you know, just more state-of-the-art stuff. They've hired a lot of staff for having people-to-people -people contact. So that'll be interesting to see. It's kind of new breaking new ground. Um, it's been done in Europe. We got this model from Darwin something or other over in Betsy was on a trip to England and saw this thing. But that was a while ago. This has been going on for, what, six, seven years or something. And um, so we don't really know how it's going to work out. But it's, it'll be interesting, but I don't know how it <laughs> I, don't I don't know what level of interest. I don't know if people are just going to like, after two months of it, they're just going to, the people that have been hired to be there full time are just going to be zombies, maybe. I don't know. To me, the workload on your feet seems pretty high. It's like, it's like being a waitress. You just going to be running around all the time <laughs> trying to serve people. It's, it's going to be different. So I'm real curious to see. Should be a lot of fun. Well, thank you very much, John. Have a great time.